still waiting. It says still waiting, okay. However, ah, okay. So I got the preview up. Now I hit this go live button. So I'm live. It's okay to start this off, faffing around with a, the live lecture. Okay, but am I just talking now? Can you can you rewind to when I started, or should I start over? You started now. I'm just starting now. Yeah, we have 12 seconds to go. Okay. In that case, whoever's watching the live feed got mid sentence into me saying something else, so I'll just do a quick. <laughs> exactly like that. Thank you. All right. Uh, slides and like I was saying about the lectures um, these lectures on Friday I'm gonna try to have lectures we're gonna go into theory we're gonna go into math and algorithms and that type of thing yes yeah is the sound on now So I'm going to switch to the slides. Do you hear me on the slides? Yeah. And I'm going to switch to the camera. Do you hear me on the camera? Yeah, a yeah, 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 a little bit of a delay. All right, I'm Kauri, computer graphics, third time. We're good. So yeah, Friday lectures, I'm going to record them. They're going to be theory. They're going to be me standing here talking a lot. Yes, the sound is now on both the camera. Yeah. I realized what I did wrong there with that. Um, so I know that a lot of people like kind of doing their schoolwork at home or at their own time and stuff like that. And we've been trying to uh, facilitate that kind of learning. But at the same time, I'm a strong believer of people learning so much more when they show up to class and when we do things together. However, just forcing you to show up to class for me to stand here doing the same thing as you can watch on a recording is also not something that I necessarily condone. So my wish is to make these Friday lectures such that you know the recording is good. I hope you still show up. You have questions. It's going to be much more fun if we're all here. Uh, the Monday classes, on the other hand, we have kind of a lecture and a lab uh, in sequence. But I'm just going to look at it as kind of four 45-minute sessions in a row. So it's a three-hour session that we have. In some cases, I might start with a lecture, and then we'll go into discussion, and then we'll go into doing assignments or doing uh, projects. In some cases, I'll just start off with some kind of project or some kind of idea, and we're just going to sit and either in groups or as individuals, either with me on the projector or not, kind of just going through different assignments. So I'm hoping that will be the uh, class that everyone will show up to. And that'll be super fun. And that will kind of be hands-on doing things during that Monday class. And that's why I have it so long, so that you know, if it takes more than uh, kind of a single lecture, we won't be in a hurry. We just have all that time to both talk about things, do discussions, and mainly just set up projects that you hands-on solve under my guidance, rather than what usually happens when people just watch lectures at home, is they then do the project themselves. Sometimes they have problems and they don't have anyone to ask. Sometimes you don't have problems, but you don't get all of the information that's kind of flowing around and different ideas from other groups and things like that that can really go, really get going when we're doing this together. Does this make sense? Does this sounds like, sound like a fun way of conducting this? I can never just look at your faces and kind of think, yeah, they're not buying this. <laughs> Either way, so I'm hoping this will work out. So Fridays, lectures. Mondays, sessions, where I hope we'll all be together. I'll set up some kind of group discussions and things, and, and also just hands-on work. So I am going to see if I can get these slides rolling. So this is basically what I was saying. Um, some of the lectures will be recorded. I, however, can't promise to record everything. Because what happens in those 
Monday sessions, I mean, it's, it's group work, it's discussions. You can't easily record that so that the recordings are, are useful. If I go up on the projector and actually program something, in many cases, I'll record it just so that you have it later. But I expect what happens on Mondays to kind of be, you know, something that's, that's hard to replicate on, on video. Um, yeah, but there'll be whiteboard explanations sometimes that I'll just record. Yes? Uh, what if you can't get to the uh, beginning of uh, Monday classes? Um, if you can't get to the beginning of the Monday classes because you have a clash with something else, in some cases, I might start them off with a lecture. And if that lecture is similar to this, maybe often I'll record it. If I have some slides or if I just have something that I need to say, I'll probably record that. Sometimes just 10 minutes, 20 minutes, something like that. Uh, if you can show up late, it's still better than not showing up because then you'll just go in and, and get into the group work when that started or into the kind of programming work. Whether it's in groups or individuals, we'll just kind of figure that out as we go along. But it's doable. It's doable. So I'm not setting a kind of um, forced attendance because I also don't believe in that. I want to see you show up because you want to show up. That'll make me happy that you're actually showing up, not because I'm affecting your grade by writing your names down and when you don't show up, but because I think we can make these Monday sessions super fun. I hope the lectures are good as well, and I hope you show up to them as well on Fridays, but the sessions kind of, I'm going to try to make those fun and interesting, or at least have the assignments that we do fun and interesting. Uh, so, yeah, but inside of those, there will be some kind of whiteboard explanations, explanations in the programming environment and programs that I'll do on the projector. I'll try to record what I can do of that, but, you know. And then there's just math problems, algorithms, things that we need to solve in order to really understand computer graphics. So, that's kind of the teaching method. That's a little bit new for me this year. And if I have a hard time making this work, maybe I'll just end up switching back to lectures and labs. But it works that way in the schedule anyway. So hopefully, hopefully we can make this make this work. Um, another thing that's new, and I'm not sure has uh, been very clear, kind of when you've been looking at the assignment, no, at the course is I was thinking about using Python and PyOpenGL as my kind of main example programming language. Before explaining that anymore, is there anyone here with a raise of hands that would object much to that, to using Python and PyOpenGL? <laughs> really? Would you rather use the Java environment I was using before, or would you rather use C++? Uh, C++ OK. So what I've always done is I've told students I have an example programming language that I use and my examples will be in. And I will, this was one C++ and I really liked working in that. I switched to Java because there was a nice kind of environment there that could be cross-platform and I could, we could um, compile for smartphones and things as well. Now I'm switching into Python because you just want a kind of clear use of the OpenGL pipeline itself without the uh, clutter of this kind of big library that I was using in Java. Uh, but I've always told people if you want to do it in something else, if you have experience doing it in C++, experience doing it in Linux, something like that, you can do your assignments like that and then we just have to figure out exactly how you return them to me, how I run them, so on and so forth. So I'm still going to have that open. For those who would rather do it in C++, you can go ahead and do it in C++. But all the examples that I will be putting on the projector will still be in Python. So you have to kind of program around that. That said, OpenGL as a standard just has the same functions on whichever platform you use them. It has the same functions. The functions have the same input and the same expected output. So you can take everything we're doing in Python and just call those OpenGL functions in C++ instead. You just have to do the things like you know, find the libraries, link to the libraries, set up your programming environment yourselves rather than kind of copying the way I do it. Is that a nice compromise in order to be able to do it in C++ instead? For those of you who want to go into the libgdx 
um, environment and do it in Java, like the way I've been doing it before, there are a lot of kind of programming sessions and recordings that I've done in the last few years in that environment. So maybe there's helpful stuff there. In some cases, you can look at those just to see the ideas that we're working with and things that I'm doing, even though you're not using the same environment, so on and so forth. So it's okay. But my examples will be in Python, so kind of the group working sessions and all that. We'll be talking about the ways it's done in Python and PyOpenGL. And we'll be using Pygame kind of just as a way to get it on to the screen. Those are the new things. Python and this kind of big four class session on Mondays with, with group work and interaction rather than just lectures and, and assistance with assignments. I think I've said more or less everything that's happening here. So the stuff that we do in these kind of lab sessions or programming sessions is not graded itself. So you're not kind of trying to finish something by the end of that session in order to hand it in. Instead, we have certain problems that we need to find solutions to. However, doing that in those classes and kind of getting to the end of that will kickstart you pretty far into what then will become your uh, hand in assignments or your programming assignments that we hand in. Yes. So will it be related to the assignments? Absolutely. Oh, okay. Always. More or less always, yes. Often in a sense that maybe for three weeks we have these lab sessions and you kind of build it up. And once you start working on your assignment that you're going to hand in, it's you maybe have to come up with some idea for how to make it into a game or make it move and stuff like that. But all the core components will simply have been built while you're doing the lab assignment. So you'll, you're just kind of puzzling together into an actual assignment what you did in the lab sessions. That's the idea. But you know, I can never perfectly promise something like this. But uh, in my experience, just doing the labs when the labs are makes working on the actual assignments so much quicker and so much easier and so much simpler. And you've already gotten all the questions that you need and asked them and gotten answers to them rather than um, skipping all the lab assignments, going directly into the hand-in assignment, and then just kind of getting all those questions popping up in much harder points in time then rather than doing it in the lab. Either way, so this is the um, the assessment. So programming assignments will pretty much be uh, four assignments, the first of them just being a really small thing just to get us going, just to make sure that everyone did the first week's lab assignment and understood things and just got their environment running. Uh, the second three, 15% each. Then we have some hand-ins of just problems running algorithms, math problems, things like that, just just theory, 2% um, each, and a final exam of 40%. Any questions regarding this? Yes? How is the final exam? Is it on paper? Or? It's written. It's on paper. So let's just go through the programming assignments a little bit, and then I'll explain better also kind of how this course works in regards with theory versus hands-on. It's kind of two courses run, running simultaneously. The one where we're programming in OpenGL and the one where we're just learning how the graphics pipeline and graphics hardware work and what algorithms and, and calculations they do. So the first one, just to get ready. Boxes move, boxes appear. We get a little input, input from the keyboard. We get a little input from the mouse. Things happen on screen, that sort of thing. Just to make sure that nobody skipped the first lab session and everyone has their environment running and such. All right. Second one is a fairly open assignment. I will be giving some examples of particular kind of two-dimensional games, but you can also just think of your own two-dimensional games and program those. If you do, though, I'd like you to um, kind of run it by me, run your idea by me. In some cases, you have ideas that maybe don't fulfill all of the stuff. Uh, 
that I expect to see in the examples that I gave. In a lot more cases, when people come up with their own ideas, it's the other way around. Like, your idea is so ambitious that it kind of doesn't fit into what we imagine a, a small 15% assignment should be. So run ideas by me just to know that you're kind of um, understanding the magnitude of your idea properly. But it's going to be a, a two-dimensional game using vector math to kind of make things collide with one another, bounce off, bounce in cor correct directions. Um, so interaction between objects in a two-dimensional environment. Um, what I call there 3 and 4 is kind of the second big programming assignment. It's split into two because one part of it is just writing the shaders, uh, writing and explaining the shaders. The other one is writing the uh, kind of geographical part of it. Again, interactions, this time in 3D, or the, the graphics are in 3D. We run around a maze with a camera, but the interactions are just kind of not walking through walls and making sure that, you know, when you get to the end of the maze, something happens. The program knows when you've won the maze. The program knows to not let you walk through walls. Uh, and we'll also be working with lights and materials and things like that to make the three-dimensional aspect of the game kind of look right. Last assignment, kind of the third big assignment, or assignment five, uh, is again very open. The assignment before that is kind of more set. It's just it is a 3D maze. There's not much you can do with that. Yeah, there are different ways to design it, different ways to set it up. The last one is very open. You can do an animation without all the collisions and interaction. You can do, you can continue with your maze and make it into a game like a first-person shooter or a platform game or so on and so forth. Um, you can go back to your two-dimensional game assignment and kind of expand it into three dimensions or you can just make some kind of 3D puzzle game or something that you think is fun. All kinds of things will be cool in the last assignment. So you can even start now kind of thinking about what you want to do with that last assignment and trying to fit the other assignments and all your ideas into preparing for kind of what the last assignment will be. Yes? Uh, are all the assignments uh, individual? Uh, for individuals? Uh, okay. Question is, are all the assignments for individuals? These programming assignments, except for the first one. The first one is individual. So everyone hands that an individual because I want to make sure everyone has gotten their environment running and gotten things going. The other programming assignments, so two, three, four, and five, they are either done by individuals or two people. So two-person groups are okay. Doing it as an individual is okay. Bigger group than that, group than that not. And there's no difference in grading between handing it in as an individual or handing it in as two people. These assignments aren't really that big that you can really kind of split the load of doing them. So in a three-person group, I have a feeling that one person will always kind of end up left out or something because you can't really split this into three portions of an assignment. I see the difference between doing it alone and doing it as two people um, is more about if people just like to program together and throw ideas between each other versus they like to program alone and just kind of crunch their own ideas, rather than that two people can actually lessen their workload by splitting things up into, into parts. Does that make sense? Other questions regarding that or the programming assignments? OK, so that's kind of it on the assessment and the programming assignments and what we're going to be doing. We can imagine that So the first programming assignment will be due probably just at the end of next week or the beginning of the week after. So we have next week's lab session and then a few more days just to get that running. And it's not a small, it's not a big assignment. It's just to make sure everyone has their environment running. Um, the second, third, and fourth ones will be more or less at the end of kind of four week parts of the course. So after about four to five weeks, We'll have the 2D game. After eight, nine weeks, we'll have the 3D maze and, maze, and then at the end of the semester, we'll have the 3D game or animation. 
you end up getting a little bit less time always for that because it's at the end of the semester and a lot of things are going on then. Um, but, you know, so try to kind of think about what you're going to be doing with that throughout the semester, knowing from the beginning right now that it's going to be an open assignment. You can almost do whatever you want. Just if you have an idea, send me a line, send me an email, run it by me, just so I can say, like, if it's way out of the ballpark. But most things kind of can be fit into the scope of the assignment that we're doing at the end. All right. So on to computer graphics in general. I used to have in my slides um, kind of big explanations of what computer graphics are and stuff like that. I've taken that out because at this point, everyone knows what computer graphics are. Everyone's used them. Everyone's seen them. Um, you know, so 15 years ago, you'd explain to people exactly what computer graphics are and how they fit in. But more or less, you know that. However, there are different types of kind of outputs that we have. Um, very old computers which had vector screens where we just kind of draw lines in specific, from specific points to other specific points. Every single screen that we have now is um, kind of a raster, raster image, an image that has a specific number of rows and a specific number of columns. And in each spot you have a pixel and that pixel has a different color whether it's either black or white or a grayscale or an actual color. That's the way all your bitmap and JPEG and PNG images are built up. That's the way our screen is built up. Just have these rows and columns of pixels that have different colors. And when you align them correctly, you get nice images. And what computer graphics do is they have different ways of simply filling in the colors for all of those pixels. So two big ways of filling in raster images are ray tracing and pipeline graphics. <clears throat> what ray tracing does is it goes in and says, all right, I have a uh, 1920 by 1080 pixel raster image that I need to fill in. So I'm going to imagine that my center pixel is some kind of arrow that points straight forward from my camera. Then I go into the corner, and depending on my lens, that you know goes diagonally up and to the left. And then I'm simply going to follow that arrow, follow, follow that direction, and see what I hit. And if I hit something, I'm going to see how light reflects on it. And if it has a reflective surface, I'm going to bounce off of that, and I'm going to continue going until I hit something else. And then I'm going to take all of those colors, and I'm going to put them together and say, that's the color for this pixel. Then I'm going to change that direction by a tiny fraction so that I'm in the pixel next to it. And then I'm going to do the same thing. And then I'm going to go to the pixel next to it and change the direction by a tiny fraction. Does this make sense to anyone, this description? And we do that for every single pixel. So for one frame in an animation, for instance, we do that for 1920 times 1,080 pixels. So all those calculations are done for each and every pixel in an HD image. After having done that, and if you have, you know, want to have a really nice looking movie like, you know, actual Disney Pixar animations or whatever, then every single pixel, you know, has a lot of both objects and environmental variables and light and fog and all kinds of things affecting it. And it'll bounce around for a while, which means that it can take minutes, even on today's supercomputers, to uh, render a single screen in a final kind of in a final production uh, version of an animation. Um, so you have these server farms with a huge amount of computers. And then when you've done a scene and need to render it, you know, every single frame can take minutes or hours. So it, it can take days to actually render the final version of a scene even with you know, a server farm of supercomputers. So that takes a long time to render. And ray tracing is used, like I say, in uh, things that are rendered beforehand. When you can actually make your image beforehand and then show it, then save it as a JPEG or save it as an MPEG or save it as some kind of animation and, and play it on a big screen afterwards, we use ray tracing or ray tracing is most often used because it takes a lot longer to render the images 
than it takes us to look at them. Pipeline graphics is what is generally used in real-time graphics in that we need to do this faster. Ray tracing can look super nice and super juicy and it's going to, you know, it can really blow your mind. You can put so many effects and interesting stuff on it and everything looks so smooth. But you can't really render an image like that 24 times per second and make it look that nice. So pipeline graphics kind of goes the other way. Rather than starting at a pixel and just going into the world and checking everything that that pixel might hit or see, and then doing that for every single pixel, instead we start with our objects. So we start with our polygons or triangles out in the environment. And we try to do as much as we can on that level, on the level of a whole object or a whole polygon or a whole triangle. And once we've rendered that, or once we've kind of figured out where it's going to be, we find out all the pixels that it will affect on the screen. So rather than taking each of those pixels out into the world and hitting that same polygon and doing the same calculations over and over and over again, we send them onto the pixels. We just calculate kind of for the corners what we can. And then we rasterize those things and kind of put them into the pixels. This is complex at this point. There are a lot of things that I'm going to repeat again and again and again throughout the course, and they'll just make more and more sense as we learn more and more things. The basic idea is ray tracing. We start at the pixel level, and we go out and check everything for every pixel. Pipeline graphics, we start at the object level, and then we take those objects, we figure out which pixels they affect, and then we find a fast way to kind of rasterize them over the pixels that they affect. And then we don't have to do anything for the other pixels for that object. All right, so different types of graphics. Yes, ray tracing and pipeline graphics are kind of the main ones. The reason pipeline graphics is bold and italic is obviously that that's what we're going to be looking at. Pipeline graphics, we're going to be looking at real-time graphics, graphics that we can render as fast as we can look at them, like a computer game, because something will happen in a computer game that's dependent on the input from the user which means you can't render every single frame beforehand like you can in a cartoon or an animation. You have to render every single frame as it happens because it'll be different every time it's run because there's a user that will affect it and something different will happen every time. So every single frame has to be rendered in an equal or shorter amount of time than it's displayed. Meaning that if we want an animation that runs on 24 frames per second or 50 frames per second, which computer games are nice in now, 100 frames per second if you're competitive. You need to be able to render 100 of those frames every single second in order to, for your graphics hardware to keep up. That's basically, yes, what I was saying, which is on this slide. Questions regarding this, ideas of computer graphics and how we use them. Is this what you imagined? You know, is, is this something you knew? Is this something you kind of feel that you already understood? Just finding common ground here with at least what computer graphics are, why we use them, what we use them for, and that there are different types of them. So real-time graphics, 25 frames per second means we have 40, 40 milliseconds to render each frame. We have 40 milliseconds of um, time at the most on our processor and on our graphics processor to be able to completely render that entire frame and put it into the frame buffer that's on our graphics hardware. So whether it's the graphics hardware itself that has the processor or if we're doing it in our main processor, it needs to end in whatever memory our screen is reading from. And if we want to get 25 frames per second, we have 45 mil no, 40 milliseconds to get that in that location so that the computer screen can read it and then we have another 40 milliseconds to get the next image in there. If we want 50 frames per second, which I think most computer games should run now, is there anyone who disagrees? Like people who do computer games, do you not usually set them up so that they run at least 50 frames per second? Or are you content with lower? All right, 20, then we have 20 milliseconds per, per frame. And I'd imagine you know that's what computer games are going for. We want to be able to render every single frame in a detailed scene with all the monsters and all the buildings and all the environment and the main character. All of that needs to be calculated, lit, shaded, drawn in 20 milliseconds. 
And then as soon as those 20 milliseconds are up, boom, we need to go again and start again. Environment, monsters, main character, lighting, shading, so on and so forth. I don't know how used you are to computers just doing things in an instant, but do you understand how much many calculations you need to be able to do per millisecond for this to be possible? Maybe not. We'll get there. We'll start to see when we look at the pipeline how what an immense amount of calculations this is, even when we're optimizing them as much as we possibly can through the graphics pipeline, still it's hard to believe that a computer can do all this in a short amount of time. So hundreds of thousands of calculations, each frame built from scratch. Is that something you expected in computer games? Did you feel like, yeah, they must kind of edit each frame, like take a frame, and then make small alterations to it. Do you feel that would be a better optimization? In two-dimensional games, it used to be possible. That was an optimization there, where you could just scroll a little, or you could simply say, tell the computer, OK, the buffer is kind of a circular buffer. So I have this image here of the background, and I'm never going to change that. I'm just going to change where you start and end when you read it. So I only have to kind of take a little bit off here, redraw that, and change where you start reading, and then you've gotten a little side scroll. Then I'm going to have to redraw the main characters if they're moving. Or maybe just take a line off them and fill in with a background. And Things like that were possible with two-dimensional games. 3D game, as soon as I rotate the camera, as soon as you just look a little bit to the left, it's not only something scrolled off one side of the screen and was added to the other. The perspective of everything changes because of how the lens works. So even if you have the same character here and it just moved a little to the left, you see just a little bit more of one side of it, or you know, its perspective uh, in the distance kind of changed. Yes? Yeah, if you want to use uh, your hands to like, explain things, you might give me a camera also, so you can see it. Uh, OK. I always use my hands a lot when I'm explaining things. I'm not sure it actually explains them better. It just kind of, <laughs> it just kind of wave around. But yes, I can, but then I have to position myself properly. Um, so yeah, that's the point we're at. So just to understand this fact that, uh, so, question? If you lock the perspective on a specific area, yeah. You can do this this kind of scrolling trick as well in three dimensions. Um, I can't see how you can kind of lock the perspective so that it'll ever look nice. Then you'll instead get jumps in perspective, I imagine. Um, well, so if you lock the perspective and don't kind of don't rotate, only move. I don't know. Even if you move forward, suddenly everything grows. And it doesn't grow by exactly the same amount in the center as it does on the edges of the screen. So everything changes. Either way, maybe I, we could go and figure out a way someplace where you can kind of do these tricks and change things. There's a lot of things like baked lighting and stuff that's kind of pre-rendered and done that way. But in the end, kind of your main three-dimensional scene um, needs to be, or at least it is in computer games and in all re uh, real-time graphics, the scene is just completely redrawn. So you have a frame, you put that somewhere where your screen reads from it, and then you find another spot and say, okay, this is where I'm now going to draw the next scene, and when I'm done with that, my screen will read from that. And you just start with that blank, and then you draw your background, and you draw your environment, and you draw everything into that. So yeah, that's that's what we, in this case, need to do. Any questions? I think more or less this is what we've, what I've been saying. Frame rendered right before it appears on the screen. And as soon as it appears on the screen, we start rendering the next one. And as soon as we're done rendering this, that one, we allow the computer to read that screen, and we start drawing the next one. So going back to here. Yeah, and so these calculations happen in what we call the graphics pipeline. 
So there are things we need to do in the graphics pipeline. Um, position camera, set perspective, then set in the positions of thousands of vertices. What happens though, the way I set it up on the slide here, yes, we calculate light for each vertex, we set up uh, a viewport on screen, we transfer the image. It doesn't really happen kind of in these steps because we position the camera and we set the perspective. Then for each set of vertices, each set of points that we send into the pipeline, we kind of finish the pipeline. So we, vertices are basically points in polygons. So a triangle is kind of a set of vertices. So three vertices will all be kind of geometrically calculated individually. Then we take them together and send them through lighting and send them through rasterization and kind of get those that polygon on the screen and actually draw it into the window. And then we start over. Or after that, um, we basically send in the next set of polygons and we draw that into the frame buffer. And then we send in the next set of polygons and we draw that. And once we've sent in all of our objects and all of our environment and all of our images, and they've been rendered in this way through the pipeline, our entire image is ready. And then we've done one frame. And then we tell the screen, okay, this new frame is ready, start reading that. We're gonna go back to where you were reading. You're not reading the new frame, we're gonna take the old frame, we're gonna wipe that, and we're gonna start over. We're gonna set the perspective. If something was changed, we need to set where the camera is looking, set the, uh, viewport where we're going to draw on the screen, set the environment. Then we just start sending these vertices through. So we have variables in the pipeline. Oh, again, I'm. Yeah, so we have these variables that we can change in the pipeline that set up what it's like. We have these variables that we send through the pipeline. So yeah, we have kind of two types of variables in the pipelines. The ones that we set to change the settings of the pipeline and the variables that we send through the pipeline that <coughs> kind of make the calculations happen. Then there are optimizations that we can look at doing operations in specific order. So certain parts of the pipeline might be able to throw out things that won't be seen earlier rather than later. If there's something blocking something else, it's nice to draw the blocking thing first so that more things can just be thrown out of the pipeline as soon as we know that they're being blocked. Rather than drawing things that are further away first, drawing them in full lighting and shading and everything, and then just drawing something on top of them. We kind of wasted that uh, calculation power. Use particular calculations and algorithms, depending on the project we're doing each time. Uh, and also kind of take these vertices into big vertex lists and outputting or sending them through all at the same time rather than just sending them in small doses. A lot of things we can do to optimize, but we'll look at that later on. Okay, cool. We're just about done with 45 minutes. I'm going to finish this lecture, then we'll take a short break, and then we'll go a little bit just on the whiteboard into the design of the pipeline itself and a little bit window to viewport mapping if we have the time. Um, so the graphics pipeline has a lot of different algorithms and operations and math calculations that happen in there. We have a lot of matrix transformations. So that's something we're going to be doing a lot of. So this course is sometimes like a little bit of a hidden linear algebra course. We're just doing a lot of matrix multiplications and linear algebra stuff. Except I try to set it up only for what we need in computer graphics and only for what's interesting to us and kind of have real world examples of what this linear algebra does rather than doing linear algebra for linear algebra's sake. We kind of do it for the sake of actually getting something interesting done and making something happen on the screen. So we have different matrices in our pipeline. We have the model matrix and we have the view matrix and the projection matrix and these make different things happen make things position themselves in the correct place, make the camera position itself in the correct place, um, make things project onto the screen with the correct kind of lens type. Is it a wide lens or is it a narrow lens? So on and so forth, perspective or not perspective. Then we have things like depth calculations 
lighting calculations, clipping to be able to rid ourselves of things that end out outside the screen. Because as programmers, we don't want ourselves always to have to calculate exactly if something is completely on screen or not. Instead, OpenGL can do that for us. We just throw in all our vertices, all our environment, and OpenGL can throw out these things with clipping, the things we don't need early on in the pipeline to save power. But we can still optimize by throwing out things where full objects in their entirety don't end up on screen. It can be much quicker for us to just throw them away and never call OpenGL, so on and so forth. Window to viewport transformation, which is what we're going to, I hope, be looking at today. And then rasterization, which is actually taking all this information and finding the actual pixels on screen and the color for each of them and kind of putting that there in the frame buffer, ending up with this, this raster image, this kind of bitmap image in our frame buffer that will then be displayed on the screen. That's rasterization. And in the modern pipeline, more and more and more things happen in rasterization. So things that happen per pixel used to be as few as we possibly could get away with in pipeline graphics. We tried to do everything per vertex or per polygon. Now, because we want things to look better and computers have become faster, we're moving more and more calculations to happen per pixel or per fragment, if you've heard those terms. So fragment operations and pixel operations, more and more stuff is happening there. It means things look nicer, but it also means we need to do the calculations for every pixel, like in ray tracing, rather than doing calculations for every polygon. So the graphics pipeline is kind of becoming more and more of a kind of merge between the original idea, which was doing things as early and fast as we can, and then just shoving things into the raster image, into actually doing a lot of calculations for the pixels as well to get things to look nicer because computers can do amazing things now. Yeah, so shading, textures, transparency, depth tests, all of these things happen on the pixel level. Fog, kind of these little interesting things that make things blend nicer and become smoother on the screen. It's nice to do those per pixel so that everything will, will kind of look, look smoother and less jagged, like old school computer graphics can look. And that's it. So that's it for this introduction. Are there questions at this point? Not really. So um, let's take a break, make it five minutes-ish, and then we'll go a little bit into the design of the graphics pipeline.
All right, let's continue. I'm hoping I can kind of stick inside this part of the whiteboard with my explanations and it'll look okay on the video. Otherwise, you'll complain and I'll try to fix it with a better camera or something later on. So I just wanted to start by kind of drawing up a design overview of the graphics pipeline itself. So if we just look at the pipeline first as kind of a series of boxes, you can imagine each of these boxes kind of represents a different algorithm or a different calculation or a different part of the environment. And I'm going to draw kind of three boxes inside this box as well, because we're going to use what's called the programmable pipeline, which is the modern OpenGL pipeline. But before that, we had the static pipeline. So the programmable pipeline has these shaders, this one called the vertex shader. One in the end here called the fragment, or actually, I'm going to draw the fragment shader as a small part of this box as well. The fragment shader. Doesn't matter if you can read it off the screen or not, or off the whiteboard or not. Vertex shader, fragment shader. So the programmable pipeline allows us to do a lot of things inside of this, these shaders and kind of choose the way things are done. The simplest way to teach you how to use them, though, is to just kind of imitate the old static pipeline with them. So in here, we have these kind of matrices which represent geometrical transformations. So we have something we call the model matrix. We have something we call the view matrix, something we call the projection matrix. So we have a bunch of things in the pipeline here, but I haven't even talked about how we use it, which is we need to send something into it. So into this pipeline, I'm going to put it singular now, we send a vertex. Let's imagine that, we just send a vertex. Or we can say, I'm going to send a polygon. And then we can go on and on and say, we're going to send a list of polygons or a list of vertices that all will change into polygons. So we're sending vertices into this. And what a vertex is, is that it's simply, in three dimensions, a x, y, z coordinate. So each of these vertices is simply a coordinate. It has an x uh, value, it has a y value, and it has a z value, which basically places it in a, in a coordinate system. So we've seen coordinate systems in, in two dimensions. Coordinate system simply looking something like this. We have x, we have y. If my point or vertex is 2.3, I simply count 1, 2 here, 1, 2, 3 up here. And then this is my point, uh, 2.3. Uh, x dimension 2, y dimension 3. We add the third dimension to go into 3D. And this is the information we're sending in. We're simply sending in positional data as vertices. Um, when we send this data into the vertex shader, there are a lot of settings that we've changed here. So here we have variables that we send through the uh, pipeline. And in the end, what happens here Last is we have what we call rasterization. We have rasterization. We have uh, a fragment shader in here, which kind of takes every pixel and does something nice to that. And what we output in the end, let's put it here, is basically we find out where each of these vertexes, first, third, first, second, and third vertices, where they end up in our final image, and then we fill in every single pixel in between. So we end up kind of filling in this area with the correct colors. 
So what we send in is simply the corners, except we don't send in the corners in the coordinate frame or in the coordinate system that this rastered image on screen uses. That's what the OpenGL pipeline is for. It finds out where it's on screen. We don't need to know that. We just need to know where it is in kind of our local coordinate frame idea. We just say we have our own world here. And when we set the variables here right, we can program everything inside our own world, inside our own bubble, and just give it coordinates that are just relative to one another. I say, this is just my model here. It's relative to its own center. I send that in. The model matrix will change these coordinates into different coordinates based on where in the world our drawing place is. So it takes our local coordinates and sends it into global coordinates. The view matrix says, well, now you're positioned correctly in this big world, but what you want to be is positioned relative to the camera, right? So it takes those coordinates and it changes those coordinates into new XYZ coordinates, which all have positions relative to the camera. So we start here and say we're in local coordinates. All right, after everything has gone through the model matrix, we are in what we call global coordinates because we're in the world. The model matrix knows where we're drawing in the world and it adjusts the coordinates that we have in our kind of local little model and it tells us where they are in the entire world. View matrix uses the position and orientation of the camera to then take those coordinates and make what we call I coordinates. So now everything is relative to where I'm looking at it from which means I can do my perspective calculation, my perspective projection, using the projection matrix, which then sends things out. And we call these clip coordinates. You don't need to understand or remember all of these names. It's just nice to see kind of the overview of the system. So that was the vertex shader. In the modern pipeline, we can do whatever we want in the vertex shader. But starting with this base is going to give us good results, and then we can kind of change whatever we want. We could do whatever calculations we want and just send something out, but we'll get erroneous results. So what happens here, though, after the projection, is that while we came in here in three dimensions, in our kind of local world, into the 3D global world, into the 3D relative to the eye, relative to the camera world, after projecting, we're actually taking these three-dimensional things, like this box, and we're actually projecting it onto, if we imagine there's a camera here. Looking at it, we're kind of projecting it onto a flat screen. <coughs> so suddenly, this 3D has just become you know, two-dimensional image, or however it looks, depending on the perspective we have. We've made a two-dimensional image here in clip coordinates. And in some cases, this image may end up off our screen. So that's what clipping does. So we do clipping. But we're still kind of working in this arbitrary screen, this arbitrary window into the world in continuous coordinates. So after having clipped away what's not supposed to be there, we're still not actually in the coordinate system of our screen of our raster image, or our JPEG, because those are so absolute. Those are just, it starts in 0, 0. It ends in 19, 20, 1080. Now, that's exactly where these pixels are supposed to be. This window here that we're kind of clipping into, that can be anywhere in our world, just depending on how our camera was looking at it and stuff like that. So the thing that happens next is what's called window to viewport transformation, and that's the point when we actually change kind of this arbitrary world coordinate thing, which is all in continuous coordinates, just based on how we set up our world, and we actually change them into, not quite physical, but we can say you know, physical, absolute coordinates on the screen. So at this point, we have two dimensions, 
we have a list of things that come along with it, like color and depth and all kinds of things. Learn about that later. But we're in two dimensions, and we're in absolute or discrete coordinates. So at that point, if we look at this final image here of the screen, we're at the point where we found actual values for this. We have actual pixels for the corners, and we have actual color for the corners. We have actually depth for the corners. We have all this information for the corners. And that's when we do the rasterization, which basically finds every single pixel that this particular polygon will affect. And it takes some kind of weighted averages of the values of all of these. And it applies them to that particular pixel. And it checks the depth for that particular pixel. Is it behind something else? Is it in front of something else? What do we do with it? And for every single pixel in here, we run the fragment shader. And the fragment shader gives us a final value. And that value is the actual color that we then stick into that pixel. And then we go on to the next one. Does any of this make sense to anyone? Cool. So this is kind of the overview of the pipeline. I don't know if I'm drawing this to make this seem more complicated to you or if I'm drawing it to make it seem more simple. I want to imagine I'm trying to simplify it by just saying this is what we need to fill in over the course of this semester. This is what's going to happen. Now we have this overview and a bunch of names that no one understands. And what we need to do is we need to fill in what actually, actually happens. Question? You uh, input your disease, and then you output you know, a triangle or a pyramid or whatever. So you have, have to have information like on the basic shape that you're trying to do. Or <coughs> on the basic shape that I'm trying to like draw. You have enough work is it to, for the rasterization to figure out. Um, so the question is, the input that we have is vertices. The output is kind of this, this blob here. Um, we could say that the output is kind of multiple outputs. The output is just what the fragment shader outputs for each pixel. Or we can say there is no output. This is just part of the pipeline that we affect. Um, we don't really need to tell OpenGL what shape it is that we're trying to send out. Because these vertices here, um, they in the end will get some positions. Depending on the data in all of this, we could have ended up we could have ended up with, for instance, a triangle that would have been like this, or vertices that would have been here. But what would have happened then is that clipping would have said, this doesn't fit here. I need to make kind of new ones. So while we were actually drawing a triangle, the shape that we get on the screen is a quadruple. This can happen just because part of the triangle was clipped away, so we had to make two new points. This just happens kind of along the course of the pipeline. In the end, the output, you know, we can also, if we have you know, points that are like this, and this would actually be this enormous triangle that just fills out the entire screen, this single set of vertices, of three vertices, would end up adding some color or some change to every single pixel in our screen. And then we can go on to the next one. So you're always imagining that the vertices are connected, you know? You don't even, yeah. Um, you don't even need to really imagine that they're connected as such, because through the vertex shader, each of these vertices goes individually. They affect one another, nothing, until they're here. Then we start clipping, and since clipping, is something like, OK, I have a line that starts here and ends here. You know, They both have an effect on that. A single point can't be clipped, except just to check if it's outside or inside. But a line can be clipped to find this new location here. And so a polygon can be clipped. So from here on, they're taken together. So they're sent three and three together. Clipping might actually end up adding one. So they end up four or even five after this. 
but from the beginning to here, every vertex is sent individually through the calculations. From here to here, the vertices are together as a set. And this set has certain things. You don't have to know the connections or in which order they are. Just in each of these calculations, you need to, well, particularly in the clipping, you just have to check how, how they are relative to the edges of the screen so that you can clip them there. Window to viewport actually doesn't need to take them together. It just takes each individually and says, I have some location in this arbitrary window, but I'm going to find the actual location in the viewport that I'm drawing into, this discrete viewport on my screen in actual bona fide pixels on the screen where I want it to be drawn. And then you find these. What rasterization then does is rasterization starts filling in. And so if we have a pixel here, a pixel here, and a pixel here, or a vertex in these locations, what rasterization does is not kind of imagine these lines and how they're connected. It simply goes to the lowest point, like if we have a vertex here, it goes just to the lowest point in this polygon, the lowest vertex, it starts there. And for every single line, it checks depending on the other ones, what will be, so if this is the line that I'm checking now, what will be furthest to the left in this particular line? What pixel will be furthest to the left? Which one will be furthest to the right? And then it just fills those in. Or in fact, it runs the fragment shader just for those. So it actually, it doesn't scan the whole thing, but it also doesn't kind of draw it imaginarily on. It just starts at the bottom, and then it goes up and it just checks which pixels are affected. And for every pixel that is affected, I run the fragment shader, I get an output, I draw that output into the frame buffer. Did that answer the question or? Yes. Okay. Again, learning about rasterization is a few weeks away. We, we don't have to worry about that that much. Question? You said they were always taking a group of threes when they do the clipping. Um, after the clipping, they continue in groups of threes. Yeah, but let's say you send in four vertices. Does that mean that one of them needs to be connected to? Uh, and to okay, this is a question kind of about yeah how the input is sent in. Okay, I'm imagining here that I'm drawing triangles, but OpenGL can draw different shapes. Um, the most common is a triangle, though. But you can draw something like a polygon or a quad or something like that in at least in desktop OpenGL, but in kind of the ES versions, they're fixed only to triangles. Um, but then you can actually, if you send in a list of vertices, you can decide how they're connected. Like in this case, will this be a triangle? And then this will be a triangle. If I say I'm going to draw triangles, and then I send in four vertices, which is kind of your question, um, the first three will be taken together as a triangle. The fourth one will be sent to the vertex shader. Then when OpenGL doesn't get anything more, it'll it'll just stop after the vertex shader, waiting for two more. So you will define before you send in, this is a triangle I'm sending in? Yes. Okay. You will define, or if you send in a bunch, if you send in a thousand vertices, you will define beforehand, these vertices should be rendered as triangles. And then it'll take the first three and render those as a triangle, the next three as a triangle. You can do other things, like you can say, I'm going to render these as a triangle strip, which looks something like this. I send in the first three, and they become a triangle. I send in a fourth, and it, along with the next two before it, will become a triangle. Then I send in a fifth, and number three, four, and five will be a triangle. Send in the sixth. Okay. So here we have six vertices. If we send them in as a triangle strip, this is what will happen. This can save us some time, because that means each of them is only sent once through the vertex shader. So we only run the vertex shader six times. But we actually get four triangles, which would mean we should have run the vertex shader 12 times. But we kind of reused, we reused the values from the vertex shader in this way. We can do another thing. We can say, I'm going to send this in as what's called a triangle fan, which means the first one I send in, number 0, and number one and number two, they're drawn as a triangle. Send in number three, it'll be 
along with number two and the very first one become a triangle. Send in number four, along with the next one before it, which is number three, and the very first one will become a triangle. So this way we can kind of draw things like circles. You know, given enough triangles here, we can kind of smooth these edges out by just doing enough triangles in a triangle fan and we can get a circle. And so on and so forth. We wouldn't even have needed to have the first one in the center. We could have just said, this is the first one. So I'll do a triangle here. The next one will be here, next one here, and here. I'm still going to get my circle. I'm going to get the exact same output. Because once we've rendered this, we don't see the edges between triangles. We want them to be smooth. So, so yeah, triangle fan, triangle strip. We define how OpenGL should read these vertices. But let's imagine the simplest option, which is just I'm going to tell OpenGL to do triangles. It takes the first three. It renders them together. Sends them individually through the vertex shader, then together as a set through the rest. Then once that is done and we actually have the first triangle here, OpenGL will go back and ask, OK, is there more in this list? No. I've done this one. I've done this one. I've done this one. Then it'll take this one and send it through, this one, send it through, this one, send it through, and it has three here, finishes the rest. At that point, it has another triangle here in the actual frame buffer. And OpenGL will go back and ask, OK, is my list empty? In this case, yes, your list is empty. So this particular run of the OpenGL pipeline is now finished. If we do the fan, does it still only send one triangle through the clipping, or does it send the whole fan through the clipping? It only sends one triangle at a time. So if you do the fan, the only change is, rather than kind of the first, second, and third one waiting here and then going together through, first, second, and third wait here. They go together through, but it stores a copy of the first or, or of the second and third. Or well, in the fine, yeah, the, the first and third. Sends the triangle in its entirety through. Then it just takes the next vertex, sends it to here, but the other two are already waiting here. So it just sends one through the vertex shader and sends those together through the rest. Stores two of them, takes the next one in, sends it to the vertex shader, then two are already waiting. So that's the difference between the fan and just doing triangles. Otherwise, one, two, and three will come here, go through, and then the next we'll have to go one, two, three, three here waiting, then we're ready for the rest. But yes, it's, it's always just kind of the single triangle that, let's just imagine we're in a, in a nice pipeline that just does triangles, because that's the most common way to actually do this. So the fan and the strip and the quad and the polygon, those are just kind of ways to send triangles through in different orders. But in the end, we will end up with three values here, each of which has been sent through the vertex shader, and those three values will go through the rest of the pipeline together. No, no, no. Okay. All right. The first part of this pipeline that I'm going to kind of look at in a lecture, and I don't think we have time today, I'd just be forced to try to run through that in 20 minutes, is going to be the window to viewport mapping. So I'm not going to do the pipeline just from start to finish. The reason I like to do the window to viewport mapping now is it's a simple algorithm. It's a nice way to just get to understand a little, kind of get warmed up in these geometrical transformations. It's very simple. It doesn't need a matrix multiplication or anything. It's just two windows, or yeah, the window and the viewport. Both of them are just parallel to the axes of the coordinate system, so there's no rotations or nothing, anything complex going on. And it's all about relative positions and ratios. Just need to say, OK, this here has some uh, left edge here, x left, and it has some right edge here. This has some, or let's call it um, window left here, and it has some window right here. This one has some viewport left, and it has some viewport right. And what we need to do is we just need to say the X coordinate here needs to yield the coordinate SX here 
which is relatively in the same position relative to the left side of the viewport and the right side of the viewport as the original X was to the left side of the window and the right side of the window. Does that make sense? So I imagine any of you could go home with this information and just kind of figure out a way to solve this. Most of you could do that without me kind of sitting down and showing you the correct way. That'd be a cool homework assignment, though. So those of you who remember, definitely go and just kind of figure out how to do this. You're not going to hand that in and you're not going to grade it. But that'll be a nice preparation for the next lecture. However, in the next session, which is uh, Tuesday, I just want everyone to have their programming environment up and running, which means we're going to have to do a lot of things in a lot of places where we don't understand them completely. Because the OpenGL pipeline is one of those things where if you don't have some correct setting everywhere, it's not going to give you anything good. So we're going to have to kind of go a little bit into the vertex shader, not in depth and not to completely understand it, but just enough to actually put some values into the variables that are here, some values that make sense and that we can at least move around a little and have some understanding on what's happening. So Monday's session is basically mainly going to be everyone with their computers. Um, basically opening the shader programs for the vertex shader and the fragment shader, getting PyOpenGL to start, and then making as simple a program in the vertex shader and the fragment shader as we possibly can, which is still complete enough to get some results. Makes sense. So we're going to have to, in our programs, to actually build matrices in arrays and then send them into the vertex shader maybe make a color and send it into the fragment shader so we can see colors change. Stuff like that. So we're going to make a vertex shader that has some variables that represent these matrices. We're going to make very simple matrices in our program and send the, those values into the variables in the shader. Make a color in our program and send those values into the fragment shader. So a lot of things that, you know, I need 12 weeks to teach you all of this, but I'm going to have to have you like right next week actually start using them because we want to get things going. We don't want to watch a blank screen for 10 weeks before we actually see something happen. So that's next week. In Friday's lecture, window to viewport mapping and possibly some vector, vector math and stuff to go along with that and coordinate systems and just this base stuff. But before that, we have Tuesday's session where we're going to everyone try to get their vertex shader and their fragment shader and their base program such that we have things happening and can start playing around with them. Question, yes? It's on Monday. Oh, it's on Monday. That is right. I've been saying Tuesday here. I've only been saying Tuesday, though, like in the last couple of sentences, right? I didn't say it in the beginning. I think. Anyway, Monday, yes. Monday session, Monday afternoon. We have a long session, and that's what we're going to be doing. And shouldn't we just end this a little bit early this time around and get out into our Friday, take a little breather, first week of university over. I'll be super excited to come back here Monday. Question. Is there any reading material? Reading material. Ah. Um, there will be. I'm sorry, there's a there's very little stuff on the website now. Um, next week, there will be more stuff. There is not an official textbook that we have, no. But there are online texts and textbooks that I will be um, kind of linking to and showing you as it goes along. But don't worry about it. I will make sure that when you need to be prepared in that way, you'll have everything that you need to prepare yourself.